Hey, so I'm here with uh, John Baker and Joe Benson from Mavenir. We're at Network X. Uh, great to see you guys. Um, John, where I wanted to start, tell us a bit about your thoughts uh, in the industry around we have single RAN, cloud RAN, open RAN. How do these all kind of mesh together from, from your point of view? Yeah, great to be here, Gabriel. And uh, good question. I think that's probably the most smoke and mirrors that's being used in the marketplace today. And, uh, you know, the single RAN, uh, you know, always gets missed with, it needs an open RAN in there somewhere. And, uh, you know, so you've got single RAN, which is the same vendor supplying all the bits and pieces, but in reality, you know, they, they all need to be open RAN, interoperability tested. Um, Cloud RAN, you know, I still view it as a proprietary solution um, from, from one of the main vendors, and then, uh, you know, open RAN itself. Now, obviously, Mavili has proven open RAN with multiple vendors on, on all the different interfaces. Um, you, you know, it's worth noting that Open RAN is not just about front hall interface, it's about all the other interfaces, the SMO interface, the E2, the O1 interface, as defined by uh, uh, the ORAN Alliance. So, um, you, know, you know, we think this whole combination of single RAN, cloud RAN is basically sell the same you have today. It's a proprietary solution and until, uh, you know, the vendors come out and have proven interoperability, then they don't have Open RAN. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know we're very clear on that subject. You know that uh, there's so much smoke and mirrors that uh, is confusing operators and you know sucking them into a vision, which may never happen. Yeah, I guess that's good. You know the operators they, they need to unpick and understand that you know what what works best for them. I think your point though that. Um that openness has these kind of multiple dimensions, right, on the front hall right. interface, into the SMO, down into the hardware, and, and so yep, forth. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, you know, to be fair, the Iran Alliance doesn't tell you how to build a product. You, you know, the, that's the good thing. The bad thing is it doesn't tell you how to build a product. And so to that extent, um, you know, you need to do a, a minimum set of compliances on a minimum set of interfaces. And, and until a vendor has actually done interoperability testing, and I think there's only one vendor left in the ecosystem that hasn't done any public interoperability testing, um, then they don't have an open RAN product. And, uh, you, you know, everybody, everybody in the ecosystem is trying hard to make this, uh, you know, ecosystem open, except for one at this point in time. Yeah. So tell us a bit about, um, John, I know there's some US government money's gone into interop testing, I think in the Dallas area, right? And there's, for the yeah. first time, we've got AT&T and Verizon both working in it to get to get some scale into the, into the um, Open RAN uh, IoT testing. Yeah, through the through the Public Wireless in, in, uh, Innovation Fund, uh, people, most people know as NOFO One, essentially notice of funding. Um, there was 150 something million dollars allocated to test methods and philosophies, of which um, Dish actually got the largest award of about 50 million um, to build a lab, what they call the uh, Cord Lab. And Mavenir is actually a, a part of that project in terms of building a lab for interoperability testing of uh, multiple vendors' products. Uh, at and was paired with Verizon to build the Accord Lab, um, which is a, a, you know, a lab in Dallas and a lab in uh, Washington. Uh, but, but, but you know, to be honest, there's so many people in that, it's, it's, it's still very difficult to see how it's all going to work out. But, you know, we are, you know, part of that project in a sense of being a, a vendor supplying product into that for testing purposes, but uh, you know, still a long way to go. And I, I think you know, our stance really is that you know, Open RAN is not a science project. It you know, it needs this interoperability testing, um, but it doesn't need a, a load of labs, if you like, to, to go make this testing. And I think that's the other problem. You know, that if you look at the ecosystem, uh, there's 21 uh, OTICs or test labs that have now been put in place outside of the ones that the NTIA is funding. So you, you can see there's plenty of test capability, but uh, you, you know, in fact, there's more test capability around than there is vendors <laughs> to actually go fulfill it. So you, you know, I think you're going to see some sorting out over time, but certainly you, you know, the, 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 the Innovation Fund has is, is got these specific projects for specific reasons in the US. Uh, to test the interoperability of uh, multiple vendor products. And, uh, you know, hopefully everything will come clean at the end, but it's early days and we'll see how this all progresses. Good stuff. Thanks, John. So, Joe, you run uh, radio products for Mavenir. That's Mavenia. right, Gabe. Yep. Um, so one thing I've been hearing, you're doing uh, ULPI now in, in Mavenir, that's right. uplink yep. performance improvement. That's right. Um, tell us a bit about, like, what you've done and where that's going. Sure. So uh, a quick intro in terms of uplink performance and what it's about. Uh, basically, it's uh, to deal with channel, channel conditions that move very fast. So usually in the case of very high mobile users, 
but it could also be in uh, standstill users as well in certain cases. Um, so that's really the problem statement. Uh, so, you know, the channel stays moves fast, uh, putting the channel estimation and the equalization uh, or one of those in the radio helps deal with that a little quicker because it's closer to the channel. So that's the uh, problem statement. Uh, we're actually implementing both the channel estimation and the equalization uh, in the radio, but we're also supporting our backward compatible with the other options where you only have the channel estimation inside the radio or the standard cat B. Yeah, and uh, give us a little bit of view onto the, the productization and a view LPI. You, you're putting, you, you're planning to put it in the radios, you've got it in the radios, how do you bring that to market? That's right, so what we're doing right now is we're actually putting into our existing uh, Massive MIMO, of course it's going to be supporting our future Massive MIMO radios as well. Uh, 32T to the is the sweet spot, so we're actually uh, implementing this via software upgrade in our existing 32T, 32R. Yeah. So, and then we'll support it of course in our future platforms as well. Yeah. And tell us a little bit then about how you know, the benefits are there in theory, faster faster channel state, uh, right. more responsive to mobile users, better uplink. Right. When it kind of washes out into a real network deployed out in the field, how do you kind of measure? How do you see the gains, the differences? Right, so there's a couple of challenges, obviously. I mean, the benefits are that it can improve your coverage to a certain extent, your capacity. Uh, and of course, the other um, indirect benefits are that uh, it offloads certain capacity out of the RAN as well because you're doing that processing in the in the radio. But of course, you can take advantage of that either by c transforming it into an energy saving, or you could actually offload it to do some other processing like uh, another band or another technology. So it's essentially it's an implementation uh, challenge in the end. Like how how good your implementation is is going to be how what gains and losses you you achieve in different scenarios. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So different vendors could have a different uh, you know performance of the OPI. One of the things which we're doing in the standards is implementing meshes to uh, just measure the layer one performance mm -hmm. uh, so that at least you get a uh, sort of benchmark in terms of layer one, how does the UOPI perform versus uh, another UOPI implementation. Yeah, let's get a little bit your feedback, you know, no need to name names, but what's the sort of operator, how are the operator uh, customers and engagements you have, how are they so, thinking about this question? Right, so I think generally operators are very receptive to UOPI implementing that. It's, uh, you know, a requirement we see across the board that they want implemented, but they also want the backward compatibility piece in there because, you know, we've deployed, for example, uh, uh, UOPI, uh, or we've deployed actually massive MIMO units out there serving commercial traffic, uh, and operators want something that's a little bit backward compatible as well. So what we see in the standards is that there are a couple of vendors that are not backward compatible, uh, they're, they're just forward compatible uh, mm -hmm. with the OPI. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna back out of the vendor, like who's doing what kind of discussion. Yep, sure. yep. Um, but I think your message is you've got, to, you've got to be forward and backward compatible, and yes. that's your position, right? Yes, so, yeah. that's right. Okay, um, with that, I think that's uh, uh, great to talk to you. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks so much, Gabriel.